Welcome to Approaches in Psychology, and if this is the start of your course, welcome to psychology. A simple definition of psychology is it's the scientific study of the brain and behavior. It's actually one of the youngest fields of science, starting around 150 years ago. Of course, before then, people were interested in behavior, but the theorizing was limited to philosophers and the brain was studied, but from the perspective of medicine. So in this video, we'll start with the work of Wilhelm Wundt who can be argued to be the first person to study behavior using scientific techniques. We can use his work to define what it actually means to study the brain and behavior scientifically. And then I'll finish this video with a timeline of psychology up to the current day. Introducing the different psychological approaches we'll then cover in more depth later on in this approaches unit. You can now follow along by making your notes in my PsychBoost workbook. 150 full color worksheets covering all the compulsory units. It's on Amazon, or you can get signed editions from my website. And teachers can order packs for the whole class. Psychological terminology. In this video, the future approaches videos, and honestly, every video on this channel, I'm gonna be using a lot of complex terminology that's likely completely new to you. A big part of becoming a good psychology student is learning these terms and being able to use them effectively in your own writing. So if you're just starting off with psychology, or even if you've been studying the subject for a while, it's a really good idea to have a key term list. If you hear a new word, you can always pause these videos and make a note of the definition. You'll often see keywords highlighted on the text on screen. If it's read, it's a word mentioned in the part of the specification I'm explaining, so you can be asked directly about it. Or purple if it's a word you should know, if you're going to write a good essay on the topic. I do have a free key term list for each unit on my website. You can print those off and fill them in as we go. I'll leave a link to the PDFs in the video description. Origins of psychology. So if this video is about the start of psychology as a science, it would be a good idea to start by defining what it means to call psychology a science. Let's begin by actually defining science. A good definition is finding out systematically and objectively about the physical and natural world using empirical methods such as observation and experimentation. Okay, there are a lot of complex words just in that definition. So let's break them down. Systematic is working according to a fixed or controlled method. So scientists have standardized plans or systems to their investigations. This helps researchers be confident that they've measured what they plan to measure. They haven't just made a mistake because of how they've conducted their study. It also means other scientists can take the plan and attempt to replicate findings using the same methods. This is a check the original results are not due to chance. Objectivity is about a lack of bias. So the research design results and conclusions are not influenced by the personal opinions of the researcher and just an attempt to support what they already believe to be true. Objectivity is possibly more of a problem with psychology than other sciences. This is because psychologists are studying humans and are likely to have strong opinions on the behaviours they study, like relationships, aggression, and gender. Behaviour can also be open to interpretation. A psychologist has to avoid allowing their personal expectations and beliefs influence how they interpret the behaviour they record. Empiricism is the idea that scientists must base their conclusions on testing ideas with data collected from the world, not just accepting theory or logical arguments. This is the basis of what's known as a scientific methodology. Scientific knowledge comes from formulating, testing, and modifying hypotheses, but we only accept these hypotheses on the basis of systematic observation and taking careful measurements when conducting well-designed experiments. Following the scientific method is really important if we're going to trust the results of any psychological studies, and it's the reason research methods are such a big part of any course in psychology. It's often not students' favorite unit, but it is fundamental in understanding and evaluating everything else that we study. Now that we have a pretty clear idea of what we mean when we say psychology is a science, let's explore the origins of psychology and how it became one. Wundt and the origin of psychology. This is Wilhelm Wundt. He's thought by many psychologists to be the father of experimental psychology. Before Wundt, much of what we would describe now as psychology would be classified as philosophy or medicine. But after observing the success of the physical sciences like physics, biology, and chemistry, and the role of experimentation in these subjects, Wundt wanted to change the way that the mind was studied, from philosophy to controlled empirical scientific research. In the 1870s, Wundt set up the world's first psychological laboratory, 
the Institute of Experimental Psychology in Leipzig, a city in Germany. Funt was the first person to call himself a psychologist, and he produced one of the world's first books on psychology, as well as the first academic journal that published psychological experiments. All of this helped establish psychology as an independent field of scientific research, and before long he had students from all over the world wanting to train at his institute. Many of these students went on to become professors in top universities in America, Europe and Russia, spreading Wundt's scientific methods. In his own research, Wundt was particularly interested in the structure of sensation and perception. Wundt's approach to research in these processes was called structuralism. This is describing the mind in terms of its simplest definable components. After Wundt identified these separate components, he would try to explain how these components actually fit together. This was an attempt to uncover the hidden structure of the mind. The method Wundt used in his research was called introspection. Wundt would first train participants to record their conscious experience as objectively as possible, and then ask them to focus on a sensory object, often a ticking metronome, and ask them to systematically report their experience of the object by breaking their thoughts down into separate elements. So, the participants would focus inwards and report sensations, feelings, and images. Wundt was careful to control these studies. He controlled the experimental conditions and the environment the experiment was conducted in. Wundt was able to record patterns of behavior that he could then use to develop general theories of mental processes. It's important to make clear, Wundt isn't directly observing these mental processes. He's making inferences. This means making a guess or an assumption on the internal mental processes happening in his participants based on their behavior. With enough observations of people all behaving the same way in an experiment, researchers can make inferences on the processes that might be driving their behavior. But inferences are effectively educated guesses, so we could of course be wrong in our inferences. As an example, let's say I make what I think is a funny joke to my class, and they laugh. I observe their behaviour and I assume based on my observation that they found what I said amusing and enjoyed the joke. However, this is a guess, an inference. It could be, in fact, in fact it's pretty likely, that they didn't find it funny and they only laughed because they felt sorry for me or because it would be too socially awkward not to laugh. Evaluating Wundt's work and influence on psychology. The main positive criticism of Wundt is compared to what came before, his work is scientific. This is mainly due to the controlled nature of his experiments, large samples, and clear methods that were open to replication. This has inspired later scientific psychologists to also study the mind using controlled methods. However, compared to more modern psychological methods, Wundt's research is not classified as scientific because of the subjective nature of his introspective methods. Participants can't be trusted to accurately report on their own mental states. It's likely those self-reports are biased, mistaken, or attempting to give Wundt the results they thought he wanted, an issue called demand characteristics. However, due to the difficulty of studying unobservable mental processes like emotional states, introspection is still used in some research and is also used in many forms of therapy. Wundt's work is also not fully scientific because of his use of inferences, these inferences are assumptions and could be mistaken. This criticism led to later psychologists, the behaviorists, completely ignoring the study of internal mental states and focusing only on fully observable stimulus response mechanisms. Because of this, the behaviorist findings were more reliable and behaviorism is seen as an approach that's more in line with scientific principles. Despite its weaknesses, the use of inferences has been influential, especially to cognitive psychologists. These psychologists also research internal mental states, but rather than ask participants what's happening in their mind, they ask participants to complete tasks under experimental conditions. The participants' ability to complete these tasks are used to make inferences about the structure of mental processes like memory, attention, and perception. By taking a scientific approach to psychological research, Wundt was one of the first to argue that behaviors have a cause, so are determined, and these causes can be studied objectively. Historical explanations of mental disorders and criminality often had a religious perspective, using ideas like sin or demonic influence. Following on for Wundt, scientifically determined approaches to mental health have led to effective biological treatments, and forensic psychology is used to understand and change the behaviour of criminals. So that was Wundt, 
at the start of what we consider modern psychology. In those evaluations, I mention the names of some later approaches to psychology. So before we move on to individual videos diving deep into each psychological approach, let me give you an overview of the development of psychology over the following 250 years by introducing each approach. Timeline of psychology. This is a timeline up to the modern day. I'll give you a very quick introduction to each approach that you're gonna learn over the next few videos by placing each approach on this line. So here we have Wundt's opening of the first psychological institute. A little later in the timeline, we have a psychologist whose name you might recognize. This is Sigmund Freud. He developed an approach to understanding the mind called psychodynamics. This was less scientific than Wundt as Freud based his ideas on case studies. Freud used introspection as part of his therapeutic work with individual patients. From this work, he developed the idea of an unconscious mind, arguing there are processes that direct our behavior that we're totally unaware of. He defined the structure of personality, claimed we use defense mechanisms such as repression, denial, and displacement to cope with anxiety, as well as forming a theory of childhood development called the psychosexual stages. We then have a group of psychologists called the behaviorists. This includes two researchers we need to know in detail, Pavlov and Skinner. These researchers rejected introspection and the idea that you could ever scientifically study internal mental processes, calling the mind a black box. They argued with the tools available to them, it was only scientific to study a creature's stimuli, what you do to it, and measure what the creature outputs, its behavior. These researchers tended to use animals so they could use large samples and fully control their environments. The behaviorists are known as learning theorists, as they study how creatures learn from their environment. Another group of learning theorists, called social learning theorists, agreed with most of behaviorism, but argued that when applied to human learning, we cannot ignore the fact that we have internal mental processes, especially when you consider humans learn not just from their own direct experiences, but from watching other people. For example, if you perform a behavior and get a reward for it, in order for me to imitate that behavior, in my mind, I must have paid attention to your behavior, I must have retained a memory of you doing that behavior, I must feel confident I'm actually able to reproduce your behavior, and I must actually feel motivated to reproduce your behavior. If any of those internal mental processes are missing, I'm not going to imitate your behavior. Also in the 1960s, another group of psychologists called the humanists emerged, and they very much disagreed with using science to explain human behavior. They disagreed with the idea that the complexity of human experience could be reduced down to being caused by simple environmental or biological factors that are testable in the lab. They also disagreed with the scientific assumption that behavior has a cause, so is determined by biological, environmental, or unconscious forces. Instead, they argue humans have free will in deciding how to act. They also thought psychology is too focused on mental illness, and instead created a psychology that explains how to become the best version of yourself what they called achieving self actualization In response to the computer revolution, an area of psychology developed called cognitive psychology. These psychologists viewed the mind and brain as similar to a computer. The computer has inputs, keyboard and mouse, and outputs, speaker and screen. The brain has inputs, our senses, and outputs, our voice and body movement. The computer has hardware, the CPU, and software, the programs that run on the CPU. Cognitive psychologists say the CPU is just like the biological hardware of the brain, and information is processed in the brain like software runs on a CPU. Cognitive psychologists attempt to explain this mental software, and do this by creating theoretical models of mental processes like memory, and placing biological psychology last, but in reality it's first, because biological psychology has its roots in medicine, and for hundreds of years, there have been unusual cases of brain damage that have suggested certain areas of the brain are linked with certain abilities. But it's only really been in the last few decades that we've developed tools like fMRI scanners that give psychologists the ability to study the active brain, and DNA sequences that have given genetic researchers the ability to scientifically study the inheritance of behavior and mental health conditions. So, welcome to the Approaches Unit. I hope you're looking forward to finding out more about the various ways psychologists study the brain and behavior. I want to thank everyone over on Patreon for supporting the channel. Because of you, I've been able to teach part-time, meaning I can make Psych Boost on YouTube for everyone. 
I do have extra resources that are exclusive to my patrons. So if you decide to sign up, you can grab those over my website. And these include over 100 exam question tutorial videos, of course, including questions on the approaches unit. I hope this was helpful and I'll see you in the next Cyclist video.